Today's teenagers are looking for hope. Suicide has become one of the leading causes of death among teens worldwide. We are called by God to eradicate hopelessness, and since January of 1993, we have been on the road ministering words of hope to teenagers in high schools across America and in nations around the world. Our message is simple. God loves you, He's got a plan for your life, and in Him, you matter. Hi everyone, I'm Dean Sykes and welcome to our You Matter television broadcast. We are so thankful that you have chosen to take a few minutes out of your life schedule today to, to be with us here on the broadcast. You know, I never take it for granted and I never just assume anything. I am so thankful that, that we have this opportunity to connect with you. Even, even though we've been doing this for quite some time, I, I still have not yet got a full comprehension of how this all this technology works, but I know this, that somehow, Looking into that camera on the other side, we get to meet you. And, and today that, that is something that we are very honored to do, very thankful for the opportunity. You know, we call our, 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 our program You Matter Television because we truly believe that every single life matters. We really do believe that. And we believe it because since January 1st, 1993, we have been on the road where I have been speaking in high schools, teen challenge centers, prisons, where we literally meet, literally I've spoken with millions and millions of people. And on this journey, I have discovered that if we can get someone to understand that God has never made a mistake, and he's certainly not gonna start making mistakes today by putting life into your very body. Job 33, four says, the spirit of God made you and the breath of the almighty gave you life. Teenagers ask me all the time, well, where, where did I come from? How did I get here? Well, there's the answer. Well, I don't believe that. Well, that's okay. You will believe one day. You know, I, I was in, in, in a conversation recently and the conversation really began to go to a place in, 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 in spiritual terms that got my, it got my attention. And I was speaking with my spiritual father and he said, you know, Dean, God did not create hell for you, for me, or for any person. Hell was created for the devil. And then he said to me, he said, you know, every single person in hell today is now a believer that hell is real and heaven is real. And one of, the, one of the things that we get to do in speaking with teenagers is get the opportunity to introduce them to the relationship side of God. God's not a religion. God is not you know, a bunch of rules, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. God is about relationship. Well, certainly there are things that he, that he has in his word that he wants us to adhere to it, 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 we're commanded to. But those aren't there to hurt us or to control us. Those are there to, to, to create boundaries where it's like on a, there, there's all kinds of games out there. And some games, you, you, when you're playing them, they, they bounce off the wall and then there's buffers and, you know, it, it, it just, it's, it's one of those things where you just, when you hit the, bump, the bumper, it, it causes you to have a safe moment. With God, his word is like hitting up against a bumper. Oh, don't do that. Or no, you can do this. And teenagers go, well, you know, they're like, like last weekend, I, I, was, I was doing something and I just had this feeling that it was wrong. <laughs> that feeling is not just a feeling, it's a person. It's the person of the Holy Spirit. It's the, it's the third part of the Godhead. You know, you have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. We know where God is, he's seated in, seated in heaven. The word tells us where Jesus is, he's seated at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you. And we also know that the Holy Spirit would not come until Jesus left. So when Jesus split, the Holy Spirit came and today he resides inside our heart. And as you're walking through life and you're living your life and you're doing what God's called you to do, or maybe you're not doing what God's called you to do, the Holy Spirit is there to really keep us in check. And as I was praying about all of what I've just shared with you, and I was praying about today's program, the Lord asked me a question to ask you, and I wrote it down. What will you do when they ridicule your faith? What will you do when they ridicule your faith? It's in the Bible. Well, I'm going to show you. Matthew chapter 9, 
Let's start with verse 18. Jesus was in a, in a crowd of people and it says, when he, while he, Jesus, spoke these things to the people, behold, a ruler, a guy in charge, somebody in leadership in the city, came and worshiped Jesus. And he said this, my daughter has just died, but come and lay your hands on her and she will live. Look at this. This is a, a city ruler. Maybe, I don't know what his position was. It doesn't say that, but he is somebody in who has authority in the city. And he comes to where Jesus is ministering. And while he's coming to where Jesus is ministering, the word says he, well, let's just read it to you again. He worshiped Jesus saying, my daughter has just died. But here, here, when you see but in the word, get ready because something's getting ready to come your way. Come and lay your hand on her and she will live. Now, now what's this guy saying? He's saying he's speaking faith. He's speaking what he wants to see happen. He's, he's acknowledged what has happened. My daughter is dead. Well, why not just go, okay, well, she's dead. Because God has promised, watch this, to, to satisfy you with long life. If you're not satisfied, you got life ahead of you. So this ruler comes up, my daughter is dead, he's worshiping Jesus, he says, but if you'll just come lay your hand on her, she'll come back. Man, there was confidence there. There was authority there. Watch, watch Jesus' response. Verse 19, so Jesus arose and followed him and so did his disciples. And as they're going, suddenly, verse 20, a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind, touched the hem of his garment. Verse 21, Jesus, for she said to herself, if only I may touch his, Jesus' garment, I shall be made whole or well. So picture this, the ruler, the city leader has just seen that his daughter has died. He gets the attention of Jesus. If you'll just come and lay your hand on her, I know the power of God that resides on you. As by the way, watch this, Jesus, the son of man, because he was in the earth as Jesus, the son of man. He put a, what did he do? He humbled himself, put deity aside and came to the earth in the form of a man. So now he's here just like you and I are here, but he has been equipped and anointed by the Holy Spirit. He's only doing what he sees his father do. He's only saying what he hears his father saying, and he's ministering to people. He's touched by this gentleman. He says, okay, let's go. He starts off, he's heading towards the gentleman's home where the girl is dead. And as he's walking, as he's going, this lady with an issue of blood stops him. Now you got two things going on here. You got the faith of the father, my daughter is dead, but I know she's going to come back. And you got a faith, the faith of a, a lady who's been dealing with something for 12 years. And in the middle of those two faith moments, you got Jesus, the answer. Don't, don't miss this today. Let's keep going. Verse 22, but Jesus turned around and when he saw her, the woman with the issue of blood, he said, be of good cheer, daughter, your faith has made you well. This lady went from a certain woman to a daughter within seconds because she got in the presence of Jesus. Now the whole time, don't, don't, don't miss, where's the, the, the leader? The city leader is right there, right there beside Jesus. They're walking to his house. Suddenly a lady who had an issue of blood for 12 years, the Bible, in one, one of the gospels, it talks about how she had spent all that she had and grew worse. So it's, I, I just have to believe that probably because she was in the same city, and because she had been having this issue for a long time, I mean, I imagine people knew about her. So Jesus says, what did he say? Your faith, your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. Your faith. It's not your preacher's faith. It's not somebody you see on television's faith. It's not your mom or dad's faith. It's your faith. Whether you're a teenager watching today, a college student, a mom, a dad, an aunt, an uncle, a grandparent, wherever it is you are on, on this continuum of time, it's your faith that makes you well, but it's not you. <laughs> See the difference? I can't heal me. I cannot prosper me. But my faith can attach to what God has done. So how, how does this work? 
It's like having, it's, it's part of grace and faith working together. It's the grace of God, what Jesus has already done, that makes available to us the faith of God. So our faith attaches to His grace, and then we see the promises of God coming into our lives. So this man has just seen a verifiable miracle happen, and he hears Jesus confirm it by saying, Your faith, daughter, your faith has made you well. And then we see from at that hour, from that very hour, she was made well. She was healed. And there had to be proof that she was healed. Now, why is that important? Because in your life today, faith isn't really faith until it produces. Hope is always in the future. We hope towards something. But faith, Hebrews 11, is now. Now faith is. Hope is futuristic, which you've got to have hope. But faith is now. So this man not only hoped, but he also had faith. This lady for 12 years had hoped one day I'm going to get healed. But the day she came face to face with Jesus and she touched him and she knew in her heart that she had been healed, her faith activated. And Jesus' next words to her were, your faith has made you well. And according to the word, in the same hour, the healing was manifested. We're going to come back in about a minute or so and pick up right where we left off. And remember, the note I made, what will you do when they ridicule your faith? The entire first part of today's broadcast is, is foundation in getting ready to answer that question. There's an 800 number on your screen. I encourage you, pick up your telephone, dial that number. Someone will answer who cares, who loves God, who knows the word. They'll pray in agreement with you. We pay, our ministry pays to have that number there because we believe so mightily in the power of prayer. Take a look at this and we'll be right back. Every single day in America, there are an average of 5,240 suicide attempts by teenagers in grades 7 through 12. Every day. That means that every two and a half days, every single seat in this arena would have a teenager sitting in it who had bought the lie over the previous 60 hours that their death would be a better choice than their life. Think about it every single seat. This has to stop. No matter where you are as you're watching this video, no matter how dark it may seem to you, as you look at these empty seats, here's the truth. The Spirit of God made you and the breath of the Almighty gives you life. God has never ever made a mistake and He's not about to start with you. You see, you were created on purpose, with purpose, and yes, for purpose. No matter where you are right now, hear me loud and clear. God loves you. He's not mad at you. You're not alone. You know why? In Him, you really do matter. Today, choose life. Sign our pledge at youmatter.us. God bless you. We'll see you. You know, we take time out of our broadcast to show you this pledge card because we are so powerfully convinced by the Holy Ghost that when you sign your name to something, you take personal responsibility for it. This pledge is something that is, it's, it's literally the centerpiece of what we do in high schools because we, when we see a teenager sign their name and tear this pledge off and hand us this portion and make you the top portion, it shows us that we're on the, we're on the road to commitment, that their lives really do matter. Right before the break, we were talking about the, the lady who had an issue of blood and the city leader whose daughter had died. Let's pick up in Matthew chapter 9, verse 23. When Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd wailing. So in other words, he's walking into death. He's walking into a room where there are people and they're sad and they're crying and they've called musicians and they're, they're playing sad songs. And it, it's, it's just, it's death. And, and in the natural, why wouldn't you be doing that? The child is dead. But one person who has the faith of God living on the inside of them can go from death to life. Watch, watch what happens now. Verse 24, Jesus said, Make room, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. Now there's a bold statement. Because in the natural, she's dead. And, and here's the question. Watch this. 
immediately, here's the response of the people, and they, the people in the house, ridiculed him. What was the question the Lord asked me to ask you? What will you do when they ridicule your faith? What did Jesus do? Verse 25 of chapter 9 of Matthew. But when the crowd was put outside, he went in to where the little girl was. He took her by the hand and the girl arose. And the report of this went out into all the land. So what do you do when they ridicule your faith? What do you do when in the, you're looking at a situation in the natural, it looks like death? You're look, it doesn't, how's, how's this going to even work? Well, what did Jesus do? First of all, he declared his faith. He declared, right here, let's just read it to you. Verse, let's see, verse 24, make room for the girl is not dead. Now, he's calling those things that be not as though they already were. Because according to the dad, several verses up, my daughter just died. So he leaves, he leaves his room, his home, and he goes and he finds Jesus. Sometimes we just got to leave the circumstances that we are in and go find Jesus. The great thing is Jesus is not hard to find. So when Jesus comes into that room and he's got all these people and they're wailing and they're, they're crying and they're, they're, they're in distress, he simply says, by faith, she's not dead. He's, make room. She's not dead. She's sleeping. And then secondly... The very next thing he did in verse 25, but when the crowd was put outside. You and I have to put outside of our, of our being, of our, of our world, the power of doubt and unbelief. Jesus knew that fear and faith would not coexist. So he had to get rid of the, the doubt and the unbelief from that little girl's room. He had to take everybody that was saying, oh, she's dead. Oh, it's sad. Oh, blah. I mean, everyone who was agreeing with, oh, this is, thank you, Lord. Everyone who was agreeing with what they were seeing, Jesus had to remove. Because Jesus saw through the eyes of faith. Sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, sometimes we just got to move away from where we are so that we can hear from God and then say what he says. So, after Jesus removed, what did he do? He removed the crowd. He then went in. So he had an instruction, by, he had to have an internal witness from the Father. He went in and he took her hand. So what does that mean to you and I today? Jesus followed the instruction given to him. Why didn't he just stay where he was and speak? Why didn't he go outside? Why didn't he leave the room? See, he was following, because remember in John, it tells us that Jesus only did what he saw his father do. He only said what he heard his father say. So Jesus, I mean, certainly he could have, the instant that he healed the woman with the issue of blood, he could have just done right there. He could have said, and by the way, your daughter's healed. But for he, but to, to, there's a reason here. He was led to go to the home. He was led to walk into a place that was full of doubt and unbelief. He was led to speak in spite of what he saw. He was led to speak that she is not dead. There's going to be a moment in your life when you may walk into a situation in your home, in your family, in your business, in your school, and have to say something in spite of what you see and say it with such a confident assurance that faith rises. So when Jesus said what he said, his next instruction from the Lord had to be, Oh, um, let's see here. He went in to where she was and he took her by the hand. So there's two things there. He went in and he took her by the hand. This may seem very elementary, but when you really think about it, when people ridicule faith, you better know how to respond. So let's go back over it. He declared his faith no matter what he saw. He then removed the doubt and unbelief from the room. Thirdly, he followed the instruction. He went into where the daughter was and he took her by the hand and instantly the healing virtue of Jesus hit her and she sat straight up. So what's the fourth part of this? Keep believing until you receive. Keep believing. Keep standing on the word of God. Keep standing in faith. Keep saying what God tells you to say. I remember years ago, I mean, this is probably, I don't know, 20, at this, on the day that we're taping this, probably 20, 22 years ago. I was walking out of a shopping center and it was in our hometown and a guy with whom I had gone to high school with saw me and I saw him, we spoke. 
And he asked me what I was doing. And I told him I was in ministry. And at that point, we were believing for an airplane. We had not yet received it and had not gotten it yet. And, and I was just, I was pretty young and all of it, but I was also full of just, I was so excited because God told me I, that I was going to have an airplane because of, of where we were going in, in, in our ministry. And I said, yeah, God's going to give us an airplane. And I'll never forget that guy looked at me and said, you mean to tell me one day I'm going to look, out, look up in the air and you're going to be flying over me? I said, yep, that's what I'm telling you. He said, I don't believe it. He turned and walked away. Well, he didn't have to believe it. I, these people looking at a, at, a, at a dead young girl didn't believe, but Jesus believed. Not everyone necessarily is going to believe or be as excited about your revelation as maybe you are. Not everyone's going to be, believe or be as excited about where your faith has taken you as perhaps you are. Not everyone's going to accept that the, the new you is the real you. That's okay. Because when it comes right down to it, our job is to obey the Word. Our job is to have the, the Spirit of God on the inside of us so strong and we are so tuned in to His frequency that if He goes, <clears throat> we hear Him immediately. Yes, sir. What, what, what do you want me to do, sir? You see, when they ridicule the faith, the ridicule will stop when the faith produces the results. And people need you in more so than they even perhaps even know because you are a container of the promises of God if you are walking around the earth today as a born again believer and you actually invest time in this word. This isn't just a once a week thing for us. This is every single day getting in here because it, it's just information until it becomes revelation. It's just information until it becomes revelation. And that's not on God, that's on us. Everything God's ever gonna do for you, he's already done. It's now our faith attaching to what he's done that causes it all to work. But you see, we only attach our faith to what he instructs us to attach to. So today, maybe, you're, maybe your faith is being ridiculed. Let's go back over our notes. Declare your faith despite what you say. Number two, remove doubt and unbelief from the situation that you're walking into. Number three, obey the instruction of the Lord. No matter what he tells you to say or do, just do it. Just, just do it or say it. Doesn't have to make sense. Remember, God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Just do it. And number four, keep believing until you receive the promises received in your life. I can sense faith being just being built right now as I'm talking. Why? Because faith comes from hearing and hearing the word. All you've done in this broadcast today is hear the word of God. Go read it for yourself. Go read Matthew chapter 9 and see for yourself the process that we've just laid out in, in, in a quick, quick time together today. There's more to come. There's so much more in this, but it begins with recognizing just because they may ridicule you, don't, don't wonder, well, I must be doing something wrong. I would suggest you, you're doing something right. I would suggest, my God, get bucket kicking happy. Just shout yourself into a place of victory because the word's clear, victory is accompanied with a shout. I could keep going, but you know what? We got to go to a break. Listen, you're getting ready to see a, a, a commercial spot, an announcement on a, my wife would call this a booklet, not a book. It's called Life on the Other Side of Rejection. Maybe you've been rejected. Maybe you're going through ridicule. This book will help get to the other side. Take a look at this and we'll be right back. Life on the Other Side of Rejection was birthed out of an encounter Dean had on the road where a high school senior asked him this question. I'm 18 years old and I've been in 22 different foster homes. Why did so many families reject me? Following that encounter and the conversation that followed, the Lord took Dean through a series of events where he led him to openly discuss the subject of rejection at each of their assembly and chapel services on the road. The directive to write this book came on a Monday morning at a large public high school in Tennessee when Dean was led to ask a seemingly simple question. How many of you students sitting here today would say to me that you've been rejected by someone you love? What happened next, no one saw coming. No one that is, but the Lord. Of the 1,700 students at that assembly on that Monday morning, 1,074 teenagers courageously raised their hands. That morning, the Lord spoke Isaiah 53 to Dean. And with that, this book began to come alive in his heart. Jesus is the only one who can heal your heart from the pain that comes from having been rejected. Simply put, Jesus knows how to get us to life on the other side of rejection. We invite you to order this booklet today. Order your copy at youmatter.us. Again, that's life on the other side of rejection. It, it is a booklet, uh, but in it are some, some truths that God taught me on the road from some very, some really special time with some teenagers who had gone through some serious, seriously heavy times in their lives. And that's, you know, one of the things that 
about the books that we write, most of them are birthed on the road because you know our our ministry is is probably 90% still on the road and 10% in, in, in studios like this where we tape our television broadcasts. But so a, a lot of what we get to share with you on the ro- on television is birthed on the road. And this this book, Life on the Other Side of Rejection, I'll, I'll never forget walking out of that, that high school gymnasium with 1,700 students there. I could take you back to the spot where I, I was walking through a door heading out to a car and the Lord dropped Isaiah into my heart and said, go read about it. And it's where it says Jesus was despised and rejected. You know, that's a, that's a big word. And, you know, today we've talked a lot about what will, what will you do when they ridicule your faith? Well, I would suggest to you that you're not doing something wrong when they ridicule. You're doing something right. To have a true, deep relationship that produces results that, get the, that gets the world's attention begins with having a relationship with Jesus, not a religion. Teenager says, one of my most enjoyable moments on any high school assembly is when a teenager walks up to me afterwards and goes, I, I, I'm going to, I go to church. That's great, I go to church, it's important. My car goes to church, it's not going to heaven or hell. So going to church, while that's wonderful and while it is important and while I'm a huge proponent of it, that's not what gets you into heaven. Only a relationship with Jesus does that. If you've not prayed this simple prayer, if you've not asked Jesus to be Lord of your life, we never like to close a broadcast without first inviting you to do so. It's a simple prayer. Father, say it out loud so you can hear yourself. Father, I believe that Jesus died and went to hell so I wouldn't have to. He did it for me. I believe that you raised him from the dead. And today, Father, I believe that Jesus is seated at your right hand and he's talking to you about me. Jesus, I have made a mess out of my life. I'm asking you by faith to come live in my heart, to become Lord of my life. I'm yours, you're mine. This is settled. Let's just do life together and let's do it in your name, Jesus. In Jesus' name, I'm born again. If you just prayed that prayer, pick up your telephone. Call the 800 number that's on your screen. Somebody who loves God, who knows the word, will grab that phone, will pray with you because this is not the end. This is a brand new beginning. This is when life really starts. Get you a Bible that you understand. You know what? The more, of, the more that you get into the Word of God, the more the Word of God gets into you and what gets into your heart in abundance is what you speak out of your mouth and what you speak becomes, creates the world in which you live. That's why the Word's so important. If you're interested in our ministry coming into your cities, into your schools or churches, hey, call the number on the screen. And thank you all. We have had a lot of phone calls. A lot of people are calling going, hey, could we get your ministry to come into our cities, to come into our schools? A lot of times people go, well, how do you do what you do in high schools? We are under authority. I never go any further than the local principal will allow me. Today's broadcast was made possible by friends and partners of Dean Sykes and our You Matter campaign. We hope you've been empowered by today's broadcast. You too can make a difference in a teenager's life. Thank you for your continued prayers and support as we hit the road to reach more teens across America and around the world. Remember, where there is life, there is hope. We'll see you next time on our You Matter broadcast with Dean Sykes.